Hello. Oh man, the mic is kind of all in the way. Let me adjust my camera really quick. Happy Monday. Hope you guys all had a great weekend. Uh, we went out for a friend's birthday. Watched a little bit of the Super Bowl. Uh, Redownloaded Dark and Darker. Ah, oh, man. We gotta figure something out. I think we're gonna get a hanging light. I can see that it is already too dark. <laughs> I am just a faceless man. Maybe that's for the best since I'm just gonna be reading today. Anyway, we got an old fashioned, so cheers. Hope you had a good Monday, Mr. One Cut Content. I noticed that I uh, have an a what is it accomplishment? Uh, uh, what does Steam call it? An achievement. Wow, I could not think of that word. Only fifty-four percent of players have been embraced. It took me all of forty minutes to do that and barely half of people who own this game have done that that's a weird stat but uh i'll take it let's uh let's go ahead and load up julia night two if we get really crazy tonight okay no i just Sorry, my dog distracted me. Uh, we'll be voicing all the characters, but I'm gonna have to use my regular voice for the main character. I'm I'm not gonna be. I don't know what Julia sounds like in my head yet. Anyway, once again, I find myself in Big Beat Burger. Familiar surroundings, faces I recognize, mood same as it ever was. Still, I process it in an entirely different way. It all frustrates me now or more precisely makes me frustrated with myself it's like I'm clinging to the remnants of a cocoon I've outgrown ugh it's the same with these cigarettes I don't need them anymore so why do I keep holding on to them fucking hell it's like I refuse to accept that I'm something better than I used to be a vampire dictionary updated uh, just two nights ago I met Karen Karen okay she embraced me, by which I mean, she turned me into a kindred. She calls herself my sire, and me, her child. I know what all this means. But, uh, for those of you who don't, let's, yeah, go ahead and look at this. Child, what a sire calls his or her vampire progeny when they're being naughty. <laughs> okay. Uh, sort of like when an exhausted mom calls their kid by their first name. also tends to be the go-to when somebody feels like they're out of arguments and needs to make their seniority known. Plural form is childer. Sire, the one who makes you a bloodsucker, a vampire's name for parent. Mine was Karen. Ah, okay. It's more like a journal than a dictionary. Uh, I guess it's either or. Kindred, a term of fellowship among vampires. That to have been coined after an anarch uprising of some sort, but the Camarilla doesn't talk about that much. The embrace, how a vampire turns their human prey into a fellow vampire for whatever reason, like most things, the details are a bit more gruesome than whatever romanticized images Hollywood has shoved down everyone's throats over the years. Uh, unless you think total exsanguination followed by the replacement of your vital body parts, or er, vital bodily fluids by someone else's sounds romantic. Yeah, no, it does not. Alright, now uh, last night she taught me the basics of survival, drinking blood, manipulating humans, bending steel, controlling shadows. Tonight I expected more lessons, instead she just told me to go out and enjoy myself. What's the catch, I asked, to which she responded. I might kill you if you prove to be a disappointment. Interesting, don't want that to happen. Uh, there are a few rules I have to uphold the masquerade. 
I can't contact anyone I knew as a human. I can't let anyone realize I'm not human anymore. I can't embrace anyone, and so on. The masquerade. The systematic secrecy of vampires built to conceal our world from humankind in order to protect us. Essentially, the masquerade is our shield against the fear and ignorance of human beings. Make no bones about it. If the vast majority of people ever learned we exist, we would be hunted to extinction. Yeah, that's probably true. And so on. Otherwise, I'm free to do whatever I want. But for some reason, the first thing I did was come back here. Old habits die hard. Another one, the Camarilla. Ah. The big boys and girls in town, the largest vampire sect I know of, plays well with mortals, or rather, plays mortals like a fiddle. Manip manipulative and rigid in structure, almost pedal really. There's a prince involved, no joke. Heavily invested in maintaining the masquerade and other so-called traditions, which helps with the two previous points. Uh, Karen is probably watching me from somewhere even now. The way I understand it, tomorrow night she is supposed to be, she is supposed to introduce me to the Camarilla, a local society of vampires. Turns out they're the ones who have been systematically ruining my life lately. All a part of some secret evaluation that I barely passed. Just imagining the reach they have makes me dizzy. After they destroyed the old me that I barely cared about, Karen rebuilt me anew. On one hand, her test left some scars that will take some time to heal. On the other hand, maybe I should just be grateful. I'm snapped out of my thoughts by a sudden scream. Ah! Some douchebag yelling about his french fries not being salty enough. Ah, oh, that is not the scream I had pictured. <laughs> okay, <laughs> scratch that. Scratch that. Ah, that was in there. I think this is my cue to leave permanently. Goodbye, Triple B. Hope I never see you again. I'm destined for greater things. You see. Oh, what is this? Man with glasses. Kind of angry man with beard. Or just silhouette of man. What would you guys pick? I'm not, uh, hovering over them does nothing. Thinking. I'm leaning towards man with glasses. He looks scary and I, I mean, I don't even know what his face looks like, so I can't trust him. The risks of swiping right. The Tinder addict smells like <laughs> A. A bit of a loser. B. A wannabe intellectual. C. A perfect source of nourishment. Ah, okay, so we get a pick. We can go for this Tinder date. <laughs> dance macabre. Uh, time to swing a little more on the devil's dance floor. The club beckons. Ah, we can go to the club. Retributive justice, a meathead bully and his unfortunate victim. I probably shouldn't interfere, but what better chance could I find to test what I've become? Nah, yeah, we're not going to do that one yet. If any one of these two would mess up my standing in the Camarilla and affect the masquerade, it would be that one. Clubbing or... Maybe Netflix and chill. The risks of swiping right. Let's do that. It's cozy night after all. Or I guess not so cozy night. He lowers his eyes awkwardly, thinking how to proceed with his rant. 
some dude nice <laughs> all right uh, so it's like the conversation doesn't really smooth yeah it's like I keep throwing shit against the wall and seeing what sticks nothing seems to stick for long you understand yeah he's just some dude we'll give him the uh-huh It's really this lack of uh, contacts that's killing me about online dating. It's bad enough when a few photos and a single sentence are all you have to re rely on when starting a conversation, yeah? But when a cosmic miracle finally happens, and she's actually willing to keep replying to you, and she's actually down to meet up eventually, and you're out there <laughs> uh, sitting with her, and after 90 minutes, you still don't have that shared context just no clue whatsoever it's just like take me out and put a bullet in my head and put me out of my misery dang dude I can't uh-huh twice but I can give him a mm-hmm so it's just one of those dates and it's like he says, and it's like one more time. We've been sitting here for ages, and the only thing she has a prolonged interest in is getting as hammered as possible, just one drink after another. And the more drunk she is, the more uh, familiar she's getting. It's these little things, you know? Touching my upper arm after each joke, her arm around my shoulder, her jokingly punching my waist. The escalation is subtle but steady. In addition, one recurring topic appears. And that is all the cool shit she has and wishes she could have shown me. Oh, too bad it's all back in her apartment. That's when it hit me. She just wants to fuck. Or sleep with me. No way! Yeah, well, eventually we both run out of ideas for topics that could potentially be interesting to the both of us. So I'm just like, yeah. I'd sure love to see all that crap in your apartment. So we Uber there, and it's like an admittedly pretty nice apartment. Like, nothing too fancy. But I can tell her dad is the kind of asshole I like to punch in the face if I ever met him. Know what I mean? So, she guides me to the kitchen and makes me some tea. A rare Indian blend. Forgot it was five minutes later, then she excuses herself and goes to the bathroom and doesn't come back. Ten minutes later, I run out of tweets to read and become a little concerned. Start looking around. Are they still called tweets? I don't know. Uh, anyway, the first thing that catches my eye is the kitchen table. Okay, we can give him another uh-huh now. Uh-huh. The table is surprisingly large and is covered in neatly arranged documents. Like, some... Connected dots, investigation board, mafia conspiracy kind of thing. Naturally, I take interest. It takes me 20 seconds to process what it is. Her entire mental health history, sorted chronologically, with all the juicy stuff neatly underlined in color. And I mean, entire. It's all in there. A detailed description of her fucked up household situation over the years. Anxiety, ADHD, bouts of depression. Suspicions of schizophrenia, schizophrenia, severe BPD, some weird psychosexual stuff with her brother. I keep reading and reading, and remember what I said about throwing shit against the wall and seeing what sticks? I'm dead certain that's how her shrink went about diagnosing her. She finally comes out of the bathroom, like an hour after she went in. At this point, I've read all of the shit on the table three times, and not just the stuff she's highlighted for my convenience. And I feel like, right now, I understand her better than, like, someone who's read Crime and Punishment. Understands Raskolnikov. And I'm not happy about that, like, at all. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. She walks in with a cheerful, Hi, I respond with a slick, all good. She nods, does this weird finger gun thing, and chuckles. I pretend I've been doing work-related stuff on my phone the whole time. The small talk starts, 
A minute in, she casually picks up one of the documents on the table, and she starts doing these super obvious body language cues that are like, Oh no, how did this get here? I'm practically dying inside, but I put on my cool face and make it look like I'm not here. Sorry, gotta reply to my boss. Yeah, he's working 24-7. Psycho motherfucker. Yeah, ha ha ha. She slowly collects all the documents, puts them away, and then nonchalantly asks me something about Tame Impala while I'm feeling crushed by all the kinds of trauma I've just learned about. The apartment starts feeling like a coffin. All of a sudden, she picks up a kitchen knife, starts playing with it with this zoned out stare. I'm fucking mortified. So what do you think I did? Slept? You slept with her? Of course I slept with her. <laughs> of course. I saw the worst six months of my life began. I couldn't even say I didn't see it coming. God, I'm such a slut. He leans back and groans while hiding his face behind his palms. I look at his neck. Every vein seems so visible and impossibly alluring. I don't think I ever looked at anyone's neck like that. I realize I feel insanely thirsty. Damn. I know. You sure took a turn. Years ago when this rant began, it was about continental philosophy. What? Sorry. Can you say that again? He's pretty drunk, barely able to focus on anything but his current train of thought. Just what was I hoping for? Years ago when this... Never mind. Listen. It's stuffy in here. I want to go out. Get some fresh air. You haven't touched your drink. I mean, I would if I could. No more alcohol for me. What? No, uh, this one's not mine. I mean, some dude bought it for me, but I don't want it. He scans the room with a death stare, looking for the guy who did it, not realizing his best chance of finding him is in a mirror. <laughs> then he drinks like half of my glass at once while I'm looking around, as if he was hoping to prove his dominance over an unseen enemy. Okay, after you. We're walking across a mostly empty street. He's focused on keeping upright and walking in a straight line. I'm focused on finding a spot where I can drink him up. You seem like bad news. Oh yeah? So why don't you just leave me alone? Determinism, I guess. I roll my eyes and that's when I notice a deep underlit stairwell. I look around and realize there's no one around. This is my chance. I immediately yank him downstairs. It's almost pitch black, but I can still see his face. He doesn't seem shocked. It's more like awkwardness. <laughs> now listen, it's not that I like never wanted to do this sort of thing in public, quite the opposite. It's just that I need a certain degree of comfort to uh, perform at optimal levels. Oh, shut up. Sing my things inside of his neck as he whimpers and becomes silent. Finally, that's what I've been waiting for for the past hour. He relaxes in my arms and I relax with him. It's like all the drinks I had to deny myself until now are hitting my head all at once with no unpleasant side effects. I feel radiant. I don't want this moment to end, but it has to. I drop his body to the floor and let the wound close, just the way she taught me. His pulse is faint but steady. He reeks of booze. If anyone finds him, there should be no suspicions. As I walk up the stairwell, I insert a finger into my mouth and try to sense my fangs. No dice. Seems they really are retractable. Well, that's handy. Oh, Scruffy! Hello there, sir. The hunger pangs are gone. I rub my hands around my body. I feel comfortable, hopeful, happy. Can't remember the last time I enjoyed life like this. Now let's keep this party going. Ah, we have to pick another one. <laughs> Do we take on the bully? 
Or do I go to the club? Fresh Club was my second option, so we'll do that. Sounds like fun. <laughs> I've had like a little bit of a throat thing for a couple days, so. I'm gonna do this as long as I can, but I can already. It's like, I don't know, my nose too. I'm gonna go blow my nose really quick. That might help. Start this up. Dance in the cob. Time to swing a little more on the devil's dance floor. Oh. Oh god. You guys saw nothing. Nothing. I'm at the tavern, I swear. Where else would I get an old fashioned like this, huh? Club reeks of death, and I love it. I've been here quite a few times, but I've never seen anything this breathtaking. Everyone around me is whacked out of their minds, and as they keep dancing madly, the spirits dance beside them. Spectral silhouettes phase in and out of existence, becoming more visible the more intense the music grows. It looks like a bizarre ritual, a profane mass. I notice the voice samples, the ghost react to the strongest. The most suggestive ones cause them to appear distorted, even tormented. Spectre. Oh. It's as if something was struggling to be born out of the harsh sounds, and the dead were hoping to be reborn alongside it. They're all uneasy, quivering with desire for something far beyond their reach. Probably the same as when they were alive. Sometimes the living dancers spot their dead counterparts. It's usually the most manic ones who notice something out of the corner of their eye for only a split second, but never realize what they've glimpsed. Some apparitions dance to a completely different tune than the rest of us. One only they can hear. Those seem the saddest. The spectacle is eerie. At times, it's unbearably melancholic. Above all, it's beautiful. I keep on moving to the rhythm until I reach a trance, like spate. And then something even stranger happens. Every now and then, when I brush against someone, a fragmentary vision appears before my eyes. A car burning on a freeway. An outstretched hand in the depths of the sea, a man jumping out of the skyscraper window. Memories of the past? Preventable visions of the future? I have no idea what it means, but I'm strangely eager to find out. 
and then there are dancers like her. Ones that aren't ghosts, humans, or even vampires. But something else altogether. This new world is full of mysteries and I plan to get to the bottom of them all. But for now, I just want to dance. Whoa, what a night. I watched Times Square from above. It's beautiful. Never thought this place could make me emotional, to be honest. But here I am, feeling deeply moved. Who would have thought? Getting up here was surprisingly easy, all things considered took me more thought than physical effort. Earlier tonight, I started experimenting with this body's limits. I realized I can jump over small buildings and climb steep walls with ease now, but my whole perception of space has shifted. I planned a scenic route across the rooftops. I did my best to avoid attracting attention, just as, just as I was told. I stayed in the shadows as much as humanly possible. <coughs> Uh oh, I spot a drone from afar. For a second, I feel uneasy. But I remember what she told me. Machines won't get a clear view of me anymore. Camera footage, photos, it's all glitched out or blurry. I'm pretty sure that's a little somber thing. Wouldn't take it for granted if I didn't try to catch my reflection earlier on. I couldn't see my face clearly. Not in the mirror, not even in the puddle. My face was like one of those one of Dolly's clocks. She told me to keep a low profile regardless. Someone might take note and track you down. She didn't care to elaborate, but it didn't sound encouraging. <laughs> God dang. My dang nose. Suddenly, it hits me that I might never be able to see my own face again. I won't be able to I won't even be able to take care of my looks by myself. And what about the long term psychological effects? A knot of anxiety tightens in my stomach. Jesus, this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. What else is going to change? Calm down, wait a second. These past few nights have been the best of my life for years. I was on a downward spiral, failing health, no future, a feeling of overwhelming powerlessness. No oh, ho, when he cuts content. It's my stashed man. <coughs> now, everything has been flipped upside down, a total paradigm shift. A bad ending is no longer the only option. I'm actually looking forward to tomorrow. I forgot how that feels. We're used to staying at a mere seconds to midnight. The doomsday clock has been effectively turned off. The cold breeze brushes against my cheek. As stupid as it sounds, I choose to read it as the world telling me to chin up. I can bend anyone to my will. I'm capable of superhuman strength. I am a master of shadows. I can do anything. Tomorrow night, I will be introduced to my duties. If everything else goes according to plan, I'll become a New York city representative of Clan La Sombra. Yeah, clan. Vampires family like trees, specifically those sharing common blood. Imagine everyone who is in your who is your blood relative. Everyone you can picture gathered around the table at Christmas, all sharing the same strengths and afflictions. It might be harder to visualize when you can come from a big family, but you're still probably only picturing a few dozen people max. There are hundreds of vampires in any given clan, maybe more. Whoever they are, whatever that means, I have no idea what to expect. But tonight is tonight, I'm free. All my worries from a month ago feel like they belong to someone else. Finally, things are looking up.
March 2020. Back at it again at Big Beat Burger. Oh, she's back. Familiar sounds, familiar smells, familiar faces. <coughs> hmm. Yet again, I'm recalling that night with ev when everything finally seemed to change for the better. I mean, it's not like I wasn't expecting everything to go back to the old, depressing normal. I mean, in the thick of it, the rational part of me recognized my state as temporary. But with these highs, there's always a hope it won't end. Or maybe that an ego death will finally occur. Be satisfied, you stupid fucking bitch. I command you. Here's all the logical evidence for why you should be satisfied. Here's the obvious direction of your life. And here's a detailed explanation of how you should treat the people that care for you. No dice. I always fall back into the same old habits. It's like they were encoded deep in my DNA. The aimlessness. The powerlessness. The spiritual exhaustion. These goddamn fast food trips. These stupid fucking self-loathing, now amplified whenever I drink somebody's blood. Maybe I should just blame it all on the misfortune of my birth. You do this social climbing until you dissociate, and then you are just this untethered, constantly frustrated ball of dumb desires. Except, I'm sort of immortal right now, and I need to figure out what to do next. I watched this obscure Asian movie once. Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachini, starring Tadanabu Asano, one of the coolest guys in the world. He plays this Mersbo like a figure, a legendary noise machine, er, oh, wow, a legendary noise musician. There's this mysterious virus spreading around the world, causing despair and mass suicides. A rich CEO's granddaughter gets sick and longs to die, so he spends fortune searching for the cure. Turns out Asano and his friend, played by this violent onsen geisha guy, are traveling through Japan, searching the corpse-strewn towns and fields for any unique item that can produce beautiful sounds. As it turns out, the avant-garde walls of noise they create are able to heal the infected. The CEO begs the band to help, offering them all the money they want, but for some reason they refuse through a series of flashbacks. Oh, they refuse through a series of flashbacks, concerts, and vignettes. A mystery unfolds. Eventually, we realize that Asano's music is not just a remedy. It's also a cause of the virus. Whenever it connects with people, they get this hunger for more extreme, more novel experiences. And eventually, they hit a wall. Nothing can satisfy them anymore. They lose their will to live. Not even the musicians are spared from this curse. They know the end will come, sooner or later. The girl is saved by a mind-blowing concert. But the tragedy is merely postponed, not averted. The last shot of a Jesus like Asano silently considering his role as savior and destroyer stayed with me. The form of this film is abrasive, little to no narrative coherence, some weird cartoonish creative choices. The Japanese noise soundtrack, the very free form and hard to understand weave of themes. But at this point, movies like this are all that truly connect with me. I'm the New York City representative of the Sombra clan right now, also known as the Night Clan. They are masters of shadows who cast distorted reflections and make modern tech go haywire in their presence. Last year, a few months before I was embraced, the Sombra had joined with the Camarilla, the biggest and most traditional sect of the vampire world. Clan La Sombra, that's us, the Night Clan. Other kindreds call us Magisters, Abyss Mystics, or Turncoats. If I want to drive home the fact that many La Sombra switched sex in recent years. But the way Karen told the story, we used to be the brains behind the Sabbat. Pretty nasty group working in opposition to the Camarilla. They have since left for the Middle East, for the most part. But a sizable chunk of my clan opted out and changed sides. Traditionally, we were entrenched in the Catholic Church back in Europe. 
but not for mystical reasons. Our path was that of coercion and puppetry, so pulling the strings of important religious leaders was just a means to an end. The Night Clan has also borderline Darwinian in their philosophy about embracing new members. The shittiest period of my life was fully orchestrated by Karen in order to see if I was good with somber material. They do not care for losers who just take it lying down. Then there's the dark. I'm still coming to grips with it, but apparently shadows aren't just absences of light to us. There are openings into some kind of hell, and we can wield them, or even use them to contact the dead. The downside? We share a classic vampire feature in that we don't really have clear reflections. This also transfers to not playing well with cameras, and by extension, having issues dealing with technology in general. Sad to group of vampires tied, not by lineage, but by ideology. The two most notable examples are the Anarchs and the Camarilla. Unsurprisingly, these two are also in direct opposition, and drifting further apart all the time. Go Anarchs! Yeah! That was my brouhaha. Two groups actually used to fight each other, but our leaders found some intel that made them reconsider their strategy. So they sent a diplomatic mission to parlay with their historical enemies. The deal they got in Chicago was simple. An unlife for an unlife. For every La Sombra vampire allowed in the ivory tower, one La Sombra vampire has to meet their ultimate end. Oh, dang. What the? What the heck? Another name for the Camarilla usually used in a less official, occasionally derogatory context. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, damn. I still remember the name of the woman who met her final death so I could begin my own life. Her name was Hester Reed, a sworn enemy of the Camarilla, a guerrilla fighter who spent decades opposing them. She was someone with far better principles than mine. From what I've gathered, well, whoever she was, her execution by my sire served to convince the New York City elites to give us La Sombra a chance. Then they set out to look for a mutually agreed upon candidate who'd become the clan's rep in the city. My sire searched for someone who gave the impression she was more than she appeared. The local court was looking for someone they could walk all over. After long negotiations, they decided I was a good compromise. Uh, court, the kindred hierarchy of rule, basically feudalism by another name. You have a prince at the top, primogen beneath him or her, a sheriff who also answers to the phone. Er, <laughs> what the heck? Who <laughs> also answers to the prince, and so on. Matters are handled at secret sanctuaries called Elysiums. Note this structure applies at the city level. Beyond that, the Camarilla's organization gets absurdly Byzantine. Final death, death, of, death for mortals is defined as the total cessation of all biological activities, but vampires, being undead, face two moments of dying. The first, when their mortal life ends, and a second, the final one, when they truly cease to exist. Usually involves Rapid decomposition of the body, up to in and including turning to dust if you're old enough, as if time has finally caught up with you. They proceed to systematically destroy my entire life just to make me show I was psychologically strong enough to join their ranks. The turncoat special, they called it. Somehow I succeeded. And it eventually led me right back to where I started. 
<coughs> I stopped writing and put my pen down. Will that be all? Ooh, Valerie. Yes, Miss Duval. I hope you enjoy your stay in London. London? Oh, I very much doubt I will. Just like every cultured person, I think the only good Englishman is a dead Englishman. Oh, dang. <clears throat> Must be nice, traveling the world and all that. Eh. Caracas, Mogadishu, Shanghai, the blood tastes the same anywhere you go. The biggest difference is that your duties become more of a hassle. Ms. Duval, every word you uttered tonight just made you more punchable. Uh, that will be all. Tell Kadir I said hello and farewell. Safe travels. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, psycho. Oh, well. I'm the lone Sombra in this town and my representational role means jack shit. No title, no perks, no whatever. Right now I'm the court scoper, doing all sorts of work nobody else will touch. My main duties? Being a sort of immigration officer. See, New York City is probably the biggest vampire travel hub in the USA, and definitely the biggest one on the East Coast. Almost every kindred arriving from Africa and Europe comes through here. The local Camarilla is nuts about bureaucracy and population control, so every vampire leaving or arriving in this town is supposed to check with me to inform me about their travels. Well, in theory at least. The VIPs play by different rules. They take care of this stuff through connections and servants. But for the smaller fish, I'm like a vampire statue of liberty. The first bloodsuckers every kindred coming to New York S City should see. On paper anyway. Uh, the first after the prince, or Kadir, the primogen council, these things vary. Yeah, I'm naturally a traitorous Lissambra, so they still prefer being traditional and hands-on about these things. The primogen council, or the prince's advisors, usually elders, though mostly the younger so-called Ancilla in New York City. Not too sure what that is. Uh, who represent the interests of the local kindred. Traditionally, each major clan, faction, or sect would be given a place on the council. This framework naturally favors the Camarilla, though anyone can bring grievances to a primogen. Not of their own clan. There are a few other rules governing who can become a primogen, but recent decades have seen the old paradigms rapidly shifting. Locally, Prince Panhard asks the council's advice often but it's no secret that she mostly uses the primogen to confirm a course of action she's already made her mind up about. Prince. Where the buck stops, the big boss of a given domain, usually a city. These are the kindred you don't want to cross. Those who have secured and held their claim against all other contenders. Prince is a gender neutral title for vampires. Hence, New York City's head honcho, Helen Panard also calls herself that. As I said at the end of the day, I'm just a gopher, and this work only serves to remind me I'm not quite in, just standing at the gate. <coughs> they haven't even given me an office, I just meet everyone in public places, such as coffee shops or this fast food restaurant. Some consider this an insult and lash out at me, but luckily, most of them understand we're in the same boat. Only here because workers who need to be reminded of our place from time to time. Speaking of, my last client is 15 minutes late. 
And I still have more errands to run tonight. This is getting irritated. To be honest. If I should just find some self-respect and leave. But I won't. My sorry upbringing left me with this stupid sense of responsibility. Ten more minutes pass. Eventually, an unfamiliar woman appears by the door. She tells someone to stand by the door and walks in. Long chestnut hair, body stuck in her late teens by the look of it, a fashionable scarf covering most of her face, elegant clothes, dignified walk. A similar to sit in front of me, trying my best not to let my impatience show. She obliges. <coughs> our response the passive aggressive the really just following orders or the I don't care about this job option yeah we'll go with this top one took your sweet time huh one day and it will be a beautiful day I'll learn how to keep all this bitterness in and stop getting in trouble sorry miss Savinsky was it this is not exactly the kind of place we expected she's scanning her surroundings like we're at a circus I hope you don't mind if I make it a quick wait, if I make it quick I'm needed in Elysium which is a courthouse for vampires or a designated peaceful place. We can go to seek resolution, often hidden in plain sight in notable public buildings, also used by mortals, such as museums, art galleries, and landmark government offices. New York City is pretty typical in this respect, as the current Elysium is a gallery in Queens called the Art Hole. <coughs> Catherine Weiss Huh I swear I've heard that name before Someone else's description of her crosses my mind That weird lady who owns the art hole But is never there Weird? <laughs> so it is her Catherine Weiss The owner of the art hole De facto headquarters of the New York City Camarilla. For fuck's sake, Julia. What are you doing calling her weird right off the bat? God knows you've already made a fool of yourself in front of enough VIPs in the city. Recover. I'm sorry, it's just that I still don't know many people there. So I have to go by the descriptions I'm giving I'm given by members of the Primogen. Well, the description is mostly correct. Outside of that one word that slightly perplexes me. Pot calling the kettle black sounds like. Oh, uh... From what I gathered, it's just that your interests are rumored to be... Um, not fully aligned with the Camarillas. And it irks some folks up there. Being a keeper of the Elysium is not enough for some, I see. I suspected as much, but what can you do? For real? She's, oh, she seems chill. Good. Anyway, uh, Catherine Weiss, wow. Yes, want me to spell it out? People often have trouble ga getting it right. I don't think she meant to say that as frustrated as my tone was, actually. Uh, forgive my indiscretion, it's just that people of your stature usually don't bother checking in with me. They usually report their arrival to one of the Primogen, and they make all the arrangements. 
I heard Prince Panhard is busy with the preparations of her big party. I assumed that if I spared her some paperwork, she'd appreciate it as a gesture of goodwill. Besides, I wanted to meet the infamous the infamous Lasombra representative out of sheer curiosity. My interest peaked once I heard about her. She looks around knowingly. Unique circumstances. Yes, uh, Prince Helen Penard had uh, trouble justifying the exorbitant rent my property would need. That's literally pennies for her, and as far as I know, she's been sitting on an empty property since last year. Looks like they got it out for you. Bad. That's what I assumed, but it's nice to get a confirmation. Well, it's not like my clan has ever been particularly popular in these parts. At least, that's what I've heard, sons of the fathers and so on. Yes, just to make sure you never met Hester, but you know of her? I do know I wouldn't be here if not for her. Have you two met? No, I only heard of her once or twice. We had a similar outlooks on many issues. Although we tended to come up with completely different solutions. In any case, I think it's meaningful that Hester died so that you could live. They feared her. Now they fear you. And that's why you're that's why they're keeping you down. If anyone who's not of VIP said this to me, I'd laugh in their face. Oh, I get what she's doing. She's trying to buy my favors. Best not to act like I'm easy to please. Stick to business. Time will tell. In the meantime, I'll need you to help me out with my documentation. Of course. So, where are you coming from? Washington, D.C. She says it the way people in Hollywood movies say it. The way that suggests her Washington is wildly different from the Washington you and I would see. What were you doing there? Take a guess. Government work? Write that down. It ought to amuse Helen a, lo a little bit. If you say so, date and hour of arrival. She takes out a plane ticket and slides it towards me. It's all here. 1 a.m. Got it. Method of transit, plan, purpose of visit. Meeting with Prince ought to work just fine. I guess. Estimated duration of visit. Undefined. Right in six months if you really need to. A place of accommodation, conditions of intended stay. The whole condition should be adequate. You tell me. I tend to be happy with Airbnb. Home sweet home. I'm not certain that I ever felt particularly at home here. That makes two of us. Curious, do you have nothing holding you here? The face of a blonde haired friend appears in my mind's eye, then vanishes. There's nothing holding me anywhere. I see. A prolonged silence. She stares in my eyes and I return to stare. She's studying me. It's unnerving, but I do my best not to turn away. Eventually, she smiles. Didn't you say you were short on time? Oh god, yes, Kier will kill me. I quickly begin to collect my stuff from underneath the table. You can simply inform him I paid you a visit. He'll understand. And I'll pass it on to everyone who should be in the know. I'll do that. Yeah, sure thing. Good. We will see each other soon, I hope. The party tomorrow night? I uh, wasn't invited. She gives me a pitying look. I understand. Well, if not given the opportunity, we should make our own. I'll be in touch. Uh, good night, Miss Weiss. I wish you a pleasant stay. Good night. And don't rush these things. You've got your whole unlife ahead of you. And you're in a position where you can take it easy. Take your time. 
get a different perspective. I nod and walk slowly out the door. When I lose sight of the restaurant, I sprint toward the subway. Slow night? I wish. You're late again, but by the way, I hope you have a good excuse. Kadir al Azmai, the mighty sheriff of New York City, is not happy with me. No wonder. I met him in front of Elysium 30 minutes later than the time we had agreed upon. Yeah, well, Catherine fucking Weiss decided to arrive fashionably late. A likely story. She's supposed to be out of the city. If you think I'm pulling your leg, boss, feel free to check my report. I pass him all of the official papers the way I do every other night. Kadir stares me down for a good few seconds. Then his steely gaze softens. You're serious. The Weiss and McDonald's? <laughs> With the mask and elegant clothes, and surrounded by the smell of french fries and hamburger patties? That must have been one hell of a sight. Technically, it was Triple B, not McDonald's. But yeah. God, I made such a fool of myself. First thing I did, I quoted somebody calling her a weirdo. I wanted to die on the spot. Serves you right, you walking faux pas. I've been trying to teach you to control your tongue, but you never learn. It's a new gaff every week with you. Still, there's good news and bad news. The good news is Catherine has a fondness for vampires of humble beginnings. Probably why she decided to see you in your, shall we say, natural habitat. She's one of those rich, art scene assholes who seek out working class cred. <coughs> I just say something about watching your tongue. The bad news is... She is very astute, so she can recognize a moron like you straight away. You never stood a chance at impressing her. Oh, shut up. You still need me for anything here? I'll get on it straight away. I wouldn't be standing out here chatting with you if I hadn't taken care of my duties. 30 minutes is all it took to finish preparations for the big party. I'm about to see everyone off. Sorry. Couldn't be helped, I suppose. There's more your loss than mine. I just wanted some company tonight. You could really use the chance to appear here on official duties. So everyone can get to know your face. Heaven knows your fast food job isn't going to get you anywhere. You need to... Uh, what do they call it? Hustle? You don't need to tell me that. But it's not like being paraded around for a bunch of blue-blooded douchebags is. He somehow manages to give me a painful nudge in the back without so much of a hint of visible movement. Language, you fool. They're coming out. Just stand here in silence for five minutes and focus on not embarrassing yourself any further, will you? Got it. The first two silhouettes appear in the doorway of the art hole. An old man in a wheelchair pushed forward by his young servant. I haven't seen either of them before. Mr. Payne, the night is still young. Hope you find the rest of it pleasant. Payne, the wheelchair. I've heard about him. Addison Payne. One of the American Camarilla's main connections to the government and Wall Street. Disabled in quite a few ways. Needs a servant to communicate. God dang, I am barely breathing right now. I'm going to go blow my nose again. I hope uh, this helps. I think that did help. If it comes back, 
We probably won't stream for too long. It's been kind of coming and going since, like, I don't know, Thursday, Friday? Anyway. I'd be full of resentment if I was embracing this condition, but apparently, Payne is nothing but grateful for his immortality. He keeps writing fervent defenses of the traditions and Camarilla customs. He did tell me to stay silent. But that ain't hustling, you know? He also told me to hustle. I should be nice to him. We'll Good night, Mr. Payne. Hmm? He wordlessly shakes Kadir's hand, but doesn't even design to acknowledge me. At least his servant gives me a small bow. I return it. They leave. Kadir turns to the next person leaving. Hi, Regent. Can't wait to see you in your outfit. Spare me, Sheriff. These fancy dress parties cause me enough suffering without your help. I can only hope you haven't conspired with Helen to embarrass me with this gift. She points to a shrink-wrapped set of clothes she's carrying inside her coat. Kadir smirks briefly. I didn't have to. As you well know, Prince Pinard displays a... Considerable foresight in the matter of party planning. Yes, if there's one thing she's deathly serious about, it's frivolities. A recognizably mortal quality, especially for a prince. We ought to celebrate it, not oppose it. Don't worry, Sheriff. I'm a big girl who knows her etiquette. I'll you know, play your game, amuse your crowd, amuse the crowd a little bit, and return to my study as fast as possible. Ailing Sturbridge, High Regent of the Chantry, of the Five Burrows, a hero of the Battle of New York, the biggest warlock in town. Could be a prince herself if she didn't have her eyes on a bigger prize. Clan Chimere, after the 8th century hermetic mage whose followers terrorized the world, the members of Clan Chimir today are the only able <laughs> are only able to practice their reality bending thaumaturgic arts after consuming flesh fresh blood. This is because the Chimir of old fucked up in their relentless pursuit of immortality and were condemned. They have recently fallen into a great schism of competing houses all vying for the title of rightful heir to their namesake's legacy. All about that rare ancient artifact, life. Nicknames include warlocks, hermetics, and transgressors. A chantry where the Tremere hang out, a lots of crusty books and smoking breakers type of place, I imagine. Regent, the principals of the schoolhouses of the Tremere, also known as chantries. Every chantry has a regent who oversees the education of all the Tremere in attendance there. Regents may also hold positions on the Primogen Council and be active in the clan's strategic defenses. Sheriff, an appointed officer who enforces the prince's edicts, and if Kadir is any measure, a real stick in the mud. A sheriff hunts down traitors and violators of the traditions. Only the greatest offenders are typically apprehended and brought back to be judged in front of an assembled court. In lesser cases, sheriffs act, act as judge, jury, and executioner. The thing is, nobody knows what prize, what that prize is. That should do it. Uh, they only know it has something to do with the goal of her thaumaturgical research. Whoever tried to find out what it is failed violently. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Oh, I'm sure you're gonna have fun. Miss Savinsky here has just, just informed me Catherine Weiss is back in town. It is safe to assume she will join our festivities. You're kidding me. Yeah. 
she sends her regards. Her neg her negative reaction intrigues me, so I to give decided to give her another nudge. She told me to send her regards and that she absolutely can't wait to catch up. Cheeky. That hint of torment on her face is less than I was counting on, but it will do. Weiss. Excellent. I'd love to catch up with her. The barely concealed venom in her voice clearly suggests the fact that suggests that in fact she'd hate to catch up with her. Yes. It looks like tomorrow night will be very special, but for now, I bid you adieu. And she's gone. Is there some kind of story between Ailing and Weiss that I should be aware of? That part about sending her guards. <laughs> that was a bold-faced lie, wasn't it? An innocent one, overselling someone's courtesies is just good etiquette. You're unbelievable. Well, I doubt High Regent Sturbridge took it as a courtesy, considering she once attempted to call for a blood hunt on Weiss. A punishment sentencing a vampire to final death at the fangs of their peers, the code of the kindred and the system for punishing transgression is the law of retaliation. Wow. Why? <clears throat> I've heard five different versions of the story, and all of them seem plausible. Catherine's relationship with this city is odd, to say the least, but hush for now. He's obviously trying to kill the conversation, and the appearance of Thomas Arturo gives him a perfect way out. Mr. Arturo! Ah. I'll ask why. Keep up the good work, eh? Is he the guy from Coteries? Nah, I've done coteries before, but this is my first time doing shadows in New York. Of course. Thomas Sartoro, an architect by trade, he's a herald, a member of Prince Bernard's inner circle, an eccentric whose thoughts seem to be ten times faster than his words. <laughs> hey, I'm tired of getting ignored. Take care on the way to your haven, Mr. Arturo. Oh wait, Harpy, when did I see that? A kindred gossip master extraordinaire will often trade their wisdom for favors or political gain. While Harpy originated as an insult, some have taken the term back and wear it as a badge of pride. After all, who doesn't need a friend who has dirt on everyone? Haven, a girl has to hide from the sun somewhere, right? That tends to be at Dakota's place for me lately. Nobody's likely to randomly stumble upon me when I sleep there. Oh, yes, yes. He disappears into the night. Well, that was brief. Maybe I should stand in their way. I might force them to properly acknowledge my existence. You severely underestimate their dedication to ignoring whelps like you. Well, not much different than the archaic human usage. Whelp is how you refer to your kid when they're fucking up. Kadir loves to use it to put me down from time to time. And just in case you're serious, I beg of you, don't. I've been meaning to ask you for a while now. I've never had the opportunity. You really hate Arturo's guts, don't you? He carefully measures his diplomatic response. I have no feelings about Thomas Arturo whatsoever. Yeah, well, considering you're always listing positives about every local Camarilla representative under the moon, I might as well have called him a cunt. Language, whelp. And as for Arturo, I will, share I will share my opinion about him as soon as I come up with one that sticks for more than a week. A group of kindred emerges from the art hole, rushing towards the street. Only a noble-looking woman stops next to us. She's wearing a hijab, but curiously enough, doesn't hide her hair beneath it. Primogen. If you were rude enough to stare, you'd quickly notice the cloth serves mostly to cover up her horrifying scars. Kadir. Oh. And young Julia. We've been acknowledged. I'm doing my best not to stare because Samir is one of the few NYC Camarilla figures who hasn't been an asshole to me yet. Still here? 
did the prince require the clan of the Hunts council in some matter? Ah, Banu Hakim. They look pretty cool. Called out some mites in the past, but that's basically a slur at this point. Are a new addition to the Camarilla, only having joined a few years ago. Before that, they were independent from both the Cam and the Anarchs, and they were used as assassins for hire. Supposed to be very good at that job, too. Nowadays, it looks to me like they've rebranded themselves as Keepers of the Law. Which still gives them the occasional chance to hunt somebody down, but no longer for payment in blood. As used to be their tradition. Or at least, not overtly. The one member of the clan that I know well, Samira, is pretty cagey about this aspect of the Banu Hakim. But I've learned from a few other sources that members of the clan have a bit of drinking have a bit of a drinking problem. Once they taste another kindred's blood, they find it hard to stop. Their inclusion in the Camarilla seems to have stirred some discontent among the Tremere. As the lawmen also use a form of blood sorcery to boost their abilities and observe different rituals. Some of them clearly religiously motivated, owned in no small part to the fact that the clan has been traditionally tied to Islam and the Middle East in general. Yes, I advised her that no matter how hard she tries, she shouldn't expect me to wear a different costume tomorrow night. She's the Banu Hakim Primogen. Just like the Lasambra, their clan was independent from the Camarilla, until relatively recently. However, they negotiated a better deal than we did. They have a Primogen for one. Hailing from the Middle East, the Banu Hakim are drawn to the practice of justice. The rules must be upheld and every transgression punished. They don't have much say in New York City, but the Prince often seeks their judgment. It's just good PR. I trust she was understanding. Those are beautiful clothes. Thank you so much. I'm eager to see the outfit you came up with. And how are you, Julia? Have you seen any lights at the end of the tunnel? I don't want to come off as windy. <laughs> Whiny, gosh, man. <coughs> Uh, sure. Yeah, and I'm pretty certain it's just a train. Sorry to hear that. I trust you're pestering the prince and your superiors to improve your standing. It's uh, it's a process. Oh, Julia, Julia, you won't achieve anything if you don't keep reaching for it. Kadir, weren't you supposed to teach her the ropes? I'm trying to, Primogen, but with this child, it's always a process. I can only wish you good luck, then. Good night, Julia. Good night, Kadir. Good night. Have a safe trip. The art hole has to be almost empty by now. You like her, don't you? Stop with your class clown act, well, it only serves to reveal deep insecurities. Wow, that's harsh. It's factual. Whereas harsh as you claim, she did tell us both to call her Sabira, but you're still keeping your distance with that primogen primogen shit. Watch your profanity. And don't project your fantasies on me onto me. I won't give you a, a lesson about professional boundaries, but I suspect the way you will eventually learn it will be extremely unpleasant. Am I interrupting something, good folks? Even though I'm constantly pestering him, Kadir's composure is unshaken. His response comes swift and unfazed. Not at all, Mr. Vander Vander Weiden. Heading back to your office. You know me, my dear sheriff. Where else would I go? Oh. Now that's curious, even though Carter Vander Weiden's is a primogen as well, Malkavian to be precise. I don't hear Kadir address him as such. The Clan of the Moon has earned its reputation as a place for total psychopaths, yet there is a twisted kind of reason to the madness of the children of Malkov. 
Their condition seems to stem from gazing too deeply into the web of connections that govern this world. From learning too much, seeing too much, feeling too much. Blood is how they self-medicate. All Malkavians suffer a mental breakdown following their embrace. Often this is an exacerbation of a disorder that are already present, but sometimes it is entirely new. Best described as unstable, there is no telling when a Malkavian will snap, or drop some unexpectedly wise insight. Called oracles, jesters, or visionaries, if you're being nice, madman liabilities, and lunatics if you're not. Hope to see you tomorrow night. Oh, I will absolutely show up, provided I can. But just in case, I already, I already apologize for not making it to the prince. Simply drowning in work these days. The rhythms, tempo, and intonation patterns of his voice are so familiar. Half of it sounds like JFK, the other half exactly like Barack Obama. Just like his appearance, it all feels so fake. He's old money, of course comes from a long line of Dutch merchants who originally settled in New York in the New York region. Runs a wildly successful law office, rubs elbows with the lead of both kindred and kind varieties alike. A derogatory term for vampires to refer to mortals comes from kindred and kind. Just remember that kind rhymes with swine. And you'll get the picture. He seems perfect in every way. And that's why he's so unnerving. He's a child of Malkov, and must be blighted with some affliction. But whatever it is, he doesn't let it show. Hard not to wonder what he's hiding. The celebrations are planned to last all week. Surely you will find the time? I pray I will, my good man. I pray I will. In case you need to reach me, you know where to find me. Have a good one. He doesn't even register my presence before leaving. Sometimes I think they're all still hoping I'll simply go away. As Carter drives away in his limousine, Kadir shakes his head. You wanted to hear about which member of New York City's Camarilla I dislike the most? Yes. He shoots me a knowing glance and smirks. Too bad. They're all my dear colleagues, and I deeply respect every single one of them. Sure you do. Wouldn't want to blurt out something that could lock you out of Mr. Vanderweyden's legal services, would you ask us sir? I do expect to find myself in need of good defense, ter good defense attorney when I, my broke, incompetent, and foul-mouthed assistant finally pushes me over the edge. Rude. Do you still need me here? I still need to swing by St. Patrick's tonight. Don't worry, we're almost done. The prince is coming out. The captain is the last person to leave the ship, huh? And there she is, Helen Pinard, the big kahuna, as someone I once knew would call her, the fatty ruler of New York City, and as a self-professed patron of the arts. Kadir, a penny for your thoughts? You should be pleased to hear the High Egypt has resigned to her fate. My prince, Mr. Van Der Vaden, is decidedly not. I suspect he will be too busy to join the festivities all the week through. Excellent. She turns to me. Miss Savinsky, weren't you supposed to accompany our good sheriff in his duties tonight? There was an unexpected change of plans. Catherine Weiss is back in the city. Catherine is here? Now that's a welcome surprise. But what does that have to do with you, Miss Savinsky? She said she didn't want to trouble you with all the paperwork regarding her arrival, Prince P uh, Pinard. It's all been taken care of. Kadir has already been informed of everything. That's certainly a nice gesture, but wait a minute. Now, where exactly did you meet her? In a fast food restaurant, my prince. I see. Helen rubs her eyes. Catherine, and for... Catherine and her love for proletarian amusement. I suppose it'll be a source of amusing antidotes for this week. If we want to avoid these situations in the future, it might be a good time to discuss offering Miss Savinsky an office of her own. We'll get to it, eventually. 
There are more pressing matters at hand. The festivities start tomorrow, and there's still so much to be done. Can you make sure the art hole is secure before leaving? Certainly, my prince. Have a good night. Good night, Kadir. Good night, Mr. Vinsky. We'll talk about your work soon, don't worry. Of course. Good night, Prince Bernard. A chauffeur escorts her to a limo. There's an awkward silence between me and Kadir until the car disappears around the corner. More pressing matters, huh? A penny for your thoughts, Sheriff? I'm certain an image of a keeper of the Elysium stuck in a fast food restaurant will linger in Prince Bernard's mind. You're far closer to your goal than you were a few minutes ago. I'm pretty sure I've heard you say something to that effect a few times now. And I stand by my words. Rome wasn't built in a day, Julia. As a Camarilla loyalist, don't you think it sucks that the Ivory Tower is so hellbent on showing disrespect to my clan? They're actually willing to make fools of themselves in the process. We've all had to endure our own hazing rituals, but yes, the current situation is not ideal. Whatever, you need a hand closing up the Elysium? I'll manage. It's getting late, but better run. Some shadow in Chicago is probably impatient to get a copy of reports you've given me. You've pleased one master, now it's time to please the other. Yeah, here's the thing about working for two masters. Neither of them really thinks of you as their own. Not knowing how to reply, Kadir shrugs. I wave to him goodbye and head for the subway. When I reach St. Patrick's Cathedral, I'm greeted by a voice that grates on me like teeth on tin foil. Well, 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 the pro prodigal daughter returns. Oh my god, no. This is the one thing I didn't want to happen. Julia, please. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh-huh. Where's Father Leonard? His clergy duties kept him from getting here on time. He sent me to apologize in his name and keep you company for a few minutes. That's the second thing he had to apologize for. He just wants his flock to live in unity. I am more than willing to oblige him. Why won't you? For the last time, I'm not part of his flock. We have a purely professional arrangement. I know you see it that way. The Knight Clan's tendency to stick close to the Catholic Church is their greatest virtue. But they still consider this relationship purely instrumental. This is why we need kindred like you to bring the spiritual change to your clan. To make them understand God's precious gifts. The closer they'd get to the light, the greater their shadows would become. Again with this insufferable sermonizing. Ben Wallace Figel here is a local nut job, an ex-artist, a degenerate who had some sort of com complete me mental breakdown in the 90s. To recover, he took religion for solace and guidance. Clan Toreador, the most artistic of the kindred, the Toreador draw their ranks from the creative class, ranging from painters to digital content creators. The Clan of the Rose boasts many former famous actors, singers, writers, dancers, and even lauded sex workers. The goal is, of course, only to fill the Toreador clan with the best of the best, but its shallow fixation on youth and beauty has caused many hasty decisions. Probably more one-hit wonders under their roof than they care to admit. Also, plenty of insufferable divas and influencers. Kadir is one of them, but surprisingly he doesn't show many of their irregular traits. Maybe other than keeping himself impeccably slick at all times. <laughs> at first he proclaimed his readiness to devote the rest of his own life to studying Nautism. After a few years though, he changed his mind and joined the Catholic Church instead. Nautism. The religious beliefs and studies pertaining to the origins of kindred and the myth of Cain, the alleged OG vampire. As luck would have it, his neophyte's zeal found a major target in me. When I first met him, I was stupid enough to tell him that I was raised Catholic and still identified as such, somewhat. 
immediately pictured me as some sort of a force for change within the camera though. And set out to put me back on the righteous path. Now he won't stop preaching to me, apparently, until I become a nun. Remember, the darkest place is directly beneath the candle. You turncoats have this unfortunate predisposition to find salvation right within your grasp. And then lose your way in the shadows. Christ. Once he starts, he just won't stop. I guess it's time to bring out the big guns. By the way, I was meaning to ask, got any news about Sophie Langley? A painful grimace crosses his face, but doesn't linger. Kind of rude to change the subject, you know. Rude? I'm just looking for a topic both sides of this conversation would care about. You know, like any guide on etiquette says you should. Salvation is a topic close to anyone's heart, whether they admit it or not. And it's pretty bold of you to assume I still care about Langley. I do not assume. I'm certain you do. The second she retires from the public eye, you stop acting like Jesus Eric Kanye and start acting like Jesus is King Eric Kanye. Coincidence? I've never had a Jesus era. Do people really call it that? Here's how it's going to work. Tell me what you know. I'll tell you what they say. And keep in mind... I I didn't know she was your sire until a few nights ago. Hell, I haven't even met her. He winces a bit at me saying hell, but let's it go. Sure. I figured you would have prodded that wound long ago if you knew. What do you care anyway? Better let you drone on about your tormented past than to let you carry on with your good missionary shtick. Professional curiosity, once a journalist, always a journalist. He scratches his head, then exhales, in a sad mockery of a chuckle. Fine. Then I'll do my best to make it short. Just like you said, Sophie Langley, every New York kindred's beloved socialite, was my sire. We first met sometime after World War II. <coughs> I left France right before the Nazis went around the Maginot Line. I struggled to keep my siblings alive with my art. Watching my brother die during the flu epidemic of 43, I was close to losing my mind. That's when she showed up. So the sheer torment in my works caught her eye. She became my patron, allowed my talents to flourish, and supported me financially. Eventually, she embraced me. As well as kindred, my artistic interests started to naturally deviate from what they used to be back when I was a poor, mortal upstart. I began to see the world the way her social circle does, and that she couldn't forgive. Instead of being a fun novelty, I became just uh, another part of the malaise surrounding her. She grew distant and then stopped seeing me altogether. I've had my share of meltdowns because of this, so I won't deny that. I locked myself out of many career opportunities, but it was an important lesson. Don't trust your elders. Vampirism affects them psychologically as well. If they take interest in you, they won't stop until they suck your soul dry and then discard you like a broken toy. Elder, a few centuries of unlife will net you this big kindred milestone. An elder is only considered an elder after outlasting his or her fellow vampires for roughly 200 years. By then, they will have learned the rules of the great metagame of Jihad, the vast hidden war waged for ages between the ancient undead. Elders are the chess masters, the rest of us are only the pieces, yada yada. For the first time since I've known him, Siegel registers to me as something other than a Bible, something nuisance. Is it compassion I feel? Do I find him relatable? How dreadful. It's possible he's strategically trying to elicit sympathy. Maybe he heard about my dramatic exit from Lodestar. And maybe he's just alluding to the way my sire left me here to fend for myself. There's only God who will never lead you astray. This is why I find your act so frustrating, Julia. You are close to getting it, but you choose sin instead. There's the Benoit Seagull I know. Almost had me fooled. Let's get back on track. What about Langley's disappearance from the city? Her path was a road to perdition. Wherever she ended up, I doubt she's too happy about it. She had plans for the future of the city, wanted to make it her ultimate artwork. She was always the vain one, and 
Of course, you are completely sure you have nothing to do with her disappearance. Please, don't tell me you're getting at what I think you're getting at. Everybody says you've been acting like you're trying to repent for something ever since her vanishing act. Then you've got a motive. Of course I'm getting at what you think I'm getting at. Benoit shakes his head. You really have the devil in your heart, Julia. Always testing me. Just asking what everyone's thinking. Are they now? Listen. I'm familiar with a lot of the insults attached to my name in the city. Those aren't exactly compatible with the image of a ruthless killer. Killer, huh? Oh, that's interesting. I haven't said anything about killing. He scrubs his hands over his forehead and collects himself before responding. Stop picking apart my every word I say in this completely unpleasant way. Here's a statement if you really want one, Miss Hercule Poirot. I don't know how to pronounce his name, I should. I've seen the movies. Uh, I know exactly who they're talking about. I do believe Sophie, the way I knew her, has met her end. Even if she's still walking this earth, she wouldn't come back here as the same prideful aristocrat. She'd have to undergo a spiritual rebirth. Someone has reminded her of her place. Her former friends. <coughs> <coughs> I'm gonna have to stop soon. Jeez. <coughs> Even that servant play toy of her went missing. No more Camarilla parties. She's done for. Whatever happened to her, I don't know. I swear on Jesus and his sandals. I had nothing to do with it. But yes, I'm still here. And she's not. And it's not a reason to gloat, but to be more humble. I received a sign from God, telling me to re-examine all the unfortunate ways I resemble Sophie Langley. Alright, I think I'm going to blow my nose one more time, and then just make it to the end of, well, this conversation this night. And I'm probably, I'm going to stop before the party, but I'll be right back. this and all of a sudden I rejected the pride I shared with her. I renewed my vows to God and committed to preaching his greatness. I mean, this is why we're having this conversation in the first place. Right now, when I think of Langley's influence on my life, I am grateful. She was a sign that got me here. And, if God wills it, maybe one day you'll look at her the same way, Julia. Mental note, whenever he circles back to his preachy tone, it's time to intervene. Alright, alright. If it makes you feel any better, I think the only way a wimp like you could have hurt her was by boring her to death with Bible quotes. Now then, quid pro quo, tit for tat. You were saying people still talk about me. I was curious if... Oh, look who's finally here. Stalling for time worked. Father Leonard rushes in our direction, carrying a folder of documents under his arm. I assume it's the one I came for. Father Leonard. Christ be praised. Julia. Yesterday I was told this is how priests greet their... 
parishioners in Eastern Europe. Forever and ever, amen. Eventually, I think we said each other's lines. Never mind, another long night. Isn't it taking a toll on you? Ah, no need to worry. These days, I sleep a few hours a day. Jordan apps take care of the rest. There's always work to be done. I apologize for being late. At least I managed to get here before you and Benoit went for each other's throats. Good, I was getting worried. Oh, what do you take me for, father? He takes you for a total bozo who's about as effective at converting people as a documentary about pedophilia in the Catholic Church. He's just too kind to say it out loud. Ouch. Here. What I have to deal with, father. But don't worry. We'll make a saint of her yet. Forget saint. For now, I'd settle for an adult in the room. Isn't that what you're for? I've been patient with that role, but by now you kids should be moving out. Not leaving crayon marks on the walls and throwing food around anytime daddy is not looking. So let's just focus on our grown up duties, shall we, Julia? Here. He gives me a folder he was carrying with him, and I pass him the reports I wrote earlier tonight. Among kindred, it is common knowledge that the Catholic Church is one of the Sombra's greatest assets. Hell, it might even be one of the main reasons the Camarilla is slowly warming up to the clan. We are technologically impaired, and as such, woefully unprepared to face the challenges of communicating in the 21st century. Hard to handle advanced encryption when you can't even unlock a smartphone. This is where the Vatican connects. This is where the Vatican connections enter the picture. A web of priests scattered all around the world exchange our dispatches between each other, making sure they all reach their destinations in total secrecy. I was told not everyone in the Holy see this. Not everyone in the Holy See is friendly to Archon. Why is that capitalized weirdly? Uh, threw me off. But the most shrewd and talented usually are. You could say they're like a mortal Camarilla, better than any intelligence agency. Remember what happened to John Paul the first when he attempted to uncover the workings of the Institute for the Works of Religion? Death after 33 days of papacy. Rumors of CIA and Masonic involvement. Not that Father Leonard has anything to do with any of this. For a Catholic priest, he's alright. He'd probably have made me stay a believer a few years longer than I did, had I known him as a teenager. Leonard is intelligent, kind, helpful towards his parishioners, treats his superiors with a healthy dose of skepticism, and is not involved in any sort of political church games. Well, at least not beyond helping me contact my bosses in Chicago every other night or so. He knows about the kindred, and he knows about the Second Inquisition. He opted to avoid the latter in order to keep the former's form oppression. Former from oppression. Because according to him, it's the right thing to do. The philosophy of the war on terror applied to us kindred. Somewhere along the way, some deep state assholes decided the way to handle the existence of vampires was to treat us as terrors. Yet the agents waging these operations against us often have no idea what the hell is going on because some intra-agency collaboration created to hunt us doesn't tell anyone anything unless it's need to know. Among kindred, the term is most often abbreviated to SI. I know there's got to be something wrong with him, some selfish motivation maybe, I haven't nailed it down yet, but it doesn't feel like he's making an effort to hide it, so I'm giving him a pass. By the way, I hope you don't mind. I finally took the liberty of asking how your parents are doing. Thank you, father, but she shouldn't have. Not a problem. A priest at uh, St. Stanislaw Koska is a good friend. He says your parents started showing up every Sunday again. Front rows. Your father is looking better and better. Makes me feel nothing, but I still give him a token nod and a grateful smile. Thank you, Father Leonard. Now, if you'll excuse me, the sunrise is almost here. 
Yes, be careful, and God bless you. Amen. Goodbye, Julia. <laughs> but I left you off the hook this time. But next time, you won't be so lucky, alright? Sure. Just one more thing on my never-ending list of events I'm not looking forward to. Guess it's time to call it a night. I'm home. Finally. You doing alright? Fine, I guess. Why aren't you asleep? I figured it's finally time for me to become more of a night owl. We've talked about making our schedules sync better. Watch your vitamin D. I'd kill to have your skin. It would be a shame to waste it. <coughs> Shouldn't have smoked so much before you got bitten, sweetheart. Should have shared your skincare routine with me back when I was still breathing. I can't just be going around sharing my one secret weapon. This is top secret stuff. MK Ultra level. Jeffrey Epstein's current whereabouts level. Wow. Uh, I'd have to kill you if I told you. Fair. My kind also has a anti secret anti-aging weapon after all. But hey, if you don't care about that. Psh. And what would that be? Adrenochrome? Close. Spirit cooking. Ah, uh, just so we're clear, you're shitting on me, right? You're shitting me. <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course I'm shitting you. We just drink blood. Nothing too satanic about that. Funny, because whenever I see your chest, I'm surprised there's no cross-shaped burn mark there. Well, since you mention it, uh, never mind. I feel a little more self-conscious than usual tonight. Don't. You want me to do your makeup before you go to sleep? No need. No need? Aren't you supposed to have some sort of big party tomorrow night? I was involved in the backstage stuff. What makes you think I was invited? Because you're the coolest, cutest, and most all-around amazing person I know. They'd be insane not to put you on the short list. Believe it or not, but most vampires are pretty insane. Interdimensional psychic vampire level insane because that's how crazy they'd have to be to ignore you like this. Yeah, I would say so. Fuck them. Then, a big bunch of posh dicks. They hate you because they ain't you. But they'll see. Jesus, how'd you do it? Do what? You always assault me with so much of this weird, stupid positivity that I can't react to without completely shifting my mental attitude. How do you do it? Oh, the answer is easy. You remember how I told you we have this spiritual connection? I can sense what you feel and want. You can sense what I feel too if you really focus. Yeah, I think that's just called a load of bullshit. Said a girl who talks to ghosts. Watch this. Agent Scully. I sense you feeling down, and I realize what you really needed to end this night. She points to one of her drawers. It's the one where she keeps her supply of... Ketamine? Come on. What? <laughs> no, wrong drawer. We're not meeting demons, we're meeting angels. MDMA? Ding ding ding. <laughs> Took you half an hour ago. Perfect timing. Thanks to our spiritual connection. Ready to fly away? The mood isn't right. I need music. Got a special SoundCloud playlist ready to go. Prepared specifically to uplift one Julia Sadinsky. Just give me a sign and I'll press play. Jesus, you're impossible. That's why you love me, I hope. I give up. Come here, let me have a taste of you. Maybe this one time, the high won't end. Alright, yeah. Uh, this stinking cold is killing me. I can't do any more right now. Um, let's see, let's see. The remainder of this week, they're streaming something on Saturday. I'm thinking Lethal Company, but I'm not entirely sure yet. Uh, Sunday will be more scruffy. He's been playing a little bit of Hunt Showdown and Helldivers. I caught a little bit of the Helldiver stuff. I wanted to get a little sneak peek at it. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty dope. I I saw the part where you 
like loaded up that artillery with the the different shells and just blasted that like behemoth looking bug. The game looks like a lot of fun. Um, and then next Monday, I'm kind of up in the air. I'll be driving back from Florida, so I may or may not stream. Um, either way, if I if it's next Monday or the following Monday, I'll be picking up right from here. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully, I can put more into it. It was hard to read today. Uh, yeah. I don't really think I'm getting sick. I don't know. I just, I'm all stuffy right now. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Love you all and peace.